Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for Place to Hang Your Cape. And this week, we could be heroes. Nah, I'd rather be an overlord. Cue the music! Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. My name is Scott James Merridew, and this is the show where we talk about various geek and nerd-related topics and are joined each week by a very special different guest. Now, this week, capers, we're talking about a comic which I've only seen a bit of, but I really like. So, capers, please give it up for Sean Jefferson! Woo! <laughs> Woo! Thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here because Sean, 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 mm-hmm. Sean, mm-hmm. 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 it's comic. Yeah, it is I comic. Like, I like it. That is such good news. Um, you're actually one of the few people who's really gotten a chance to look at the preview so far. So I'm <gasps> a pod capers exclusive. Sorry. A pod capers exclusive. I shouted a bit too much there. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I think you peaked my mic a little bit and it just kind of went, oops. But, um, what is yeah. this guy? I can't handle this. I'm only a little microphone. <laughs> well, I'm very, very pleased that you enjoyed the preview. I think you and maybe uh, three other people have seen it and only one of them's got back to me about it so far. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that you enjoyed it, even though it was only 25 pages. So, it was, Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, I think the good benchmark for any comic, or indeed anything of media, is uh, you give it a little taste, and if you want to see more, that means it's good. I got a little taste, and I want more. Yay! That's great news. Which which runs some awful sort of connotations with, you know, uh, drugs and junkies. You know, I've had a little hit, and now I need more. Hey, man, hey, I, I, I need my fix. I need my overlord fix. (laughs) <laughs> to be fair, though, if you have to be addicted to something, comics is probably significantly better for you than, say, drugs or alcohol. So you're although roundabout doing well. as round, though roundabout as expensive nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> I actually can't uh, testify to that, um, but I would imagine yes. I mean, okay, well, buying in, books in it, general is becoming expensive. Yeah, I mean, indie. Co- this is why I've now actually decided to. Go to my local library and get a library card. I haven't done that in wow. years. I'm such a grown up. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, you're onto something there because I, I have a library card because I'm such an adult. Um, but having fun it, isn't hard yeah. when you've got a library <laughs> card. Bam. But yeah, it's actually really handy though because my local library, um, their comics collection was not great i'm trying to be polite about it but it wasn't great and i think by doing things like getting a library card and then going to your library and being like where the comics at bro they kind of have to actually do something about it so in the last year or two they've really expanded the collection so um yeah go get library cards people and then rent comics and read them and then tell your friends about them because it's important there's so. a lot there's a lot of graphic novels in my uh, library there's also a lot of a fe- well a bit of a manga there which I'm mm-hmm. hesitant to dip my toe into those uh, deep, deep waters, but I am still interested. But before we do, we can't spend the whole time talking about libraries as much as I would like to. I think we should talk about you. Who are you? What do you do? Where are you from? What's your reason for being? Wow, that's a list. Okay, uh, my name is Sean Jefferson. I am from Cardiff in Wales. Boo! And you shut up. And Never! <laughs> I'm... Uh, I'm an indie comic book artist, so I pretty much spend my entire time sitting at my tiny little IKEA desk making comics because. Oh, and, you, and you've got IKEA. Ugh. I know, I know. We've got IKEA and electricity and the wheel. It's okay, England. We're going to be fine. But. Um, <laughs> Not yeah. with IKEA. I hate IKEA. Well, nobody likes going to IKEA, but. You know, you I have refuse to, to go to a shop that makes me go around a one-way system. I will go around the shop any way I so please, Ikea. You know, I heard as well that they're all laid out in exactly the same way so that you can find, like, anything you're looking for, no matter which Ikea you're in. For the record, though, I always order mine online because I'm only ever in there for one thing. I don't really need to traverse the entire thing just to buy one piece of furniture. So the internet is a great thing when it comes to this. But uh, yeah, 
<laughs> and it, it's the only It's destroying the high street. Life. Do you think so? No. Well, I mean, okay. Here's the okay, soapbox time. Possibly. Yeah, yes, it may be damaging the economy of uh, local shops and stuff like that. But here's the thing. It's damaging those economies and that industry in the same way that the car damaged the horse and buggy industry. Maybe mm. it's a natural progression. The only way mm. I would say that it's uh, not really fair is that, uh, sorry for some people out there, that do not have access to internet or the yeah. access to internet is very expensive so they can't make purchases that they might need. Because here's the sure. thing, any shop can create a website and sell the stuff online. That may be slightly difficult for some people and obviously they've got to ship them and stuff, but it is still technically possible. So I, 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 don't, I don't know. I think this may be a natural forward progression of our society, but that doesn't mm. mean that it doesn't have some problems to it. So let's just sure. fix the problem so that everyone is uplifted, you know? Let's make sure that everyone is going forward together and we're not leaving anyone behind. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of lack of internet access, I think that is an issue that uh, not all parts of Wales, but there are some parts of Wales. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but we've got a nice clump of mountains in the middle of our country. I've been up those mountains. Right. And they are not. Fuck you, Penny fan. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like everyone I know is like, hey, Penavan, it's so great and beautiful. And I'm like, yeah, it is. But have you ever had to actually walk up it? Because I'm not going to lie. That sucks. It sucks. I love Wales. But Penavan, no. Hell no. Never. I, mm. I bled for the Duke of Edinburgh Award. <laughs> Literally, physically shed my precious lifeblood. <laughs> oh man i never even got as far as the duke of edinburgh award i don't think oh my I, god do i no no i didn't go <laughs> yeah did you meet but, the duke uh, of edinburgh because i did i went through all that just so i could meet prince philip and he didn't even do me the courtesy of saying something racist oh well that's disappointing i mean that's half the reason that people meet prince philip right yes Exactly. Or at least for him to say something inappropriate about someone's hat. I don't know. But don't know. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sorry that Penavan made you bleed. I, you're not the only one if it's any consolation. Not, not mm. The thought that it's hurt others is not a consolation, to be honest. <laughs> uh, there's a reason why the fucking SAS train in Brecon Beacons. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there's a reason why every now and again, unfortunately, we do have, we do occasionally see on the news that someone had an accident or, like, God forbid, that a soldier has died on training or whatever. Like, mm. the Brecon Beacons are nothing to be messed with. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, but we, 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 we can need to move away from the geography of Wales, otherwise we'd be here all day. That, that's <laughs> my, it, I want to clarify some things. That's my issue with Wales. It's not the Welsh people. It's not even the Welsh culture. It's the fucking geography. It's the hills and the valleys and the mountains and the sheep. The fucking sheep everywhere staring at you with those dead sheep eyes. <laughs> they can see into your soul, that's why. They see into your soul and what they see does not impress. <laughs> but you do have a point about the geography of Wales. I mean, there's a reason that we don't have any, like, major motorways running from the north to the south. If you want to get from North Wales to South Wales quickly, you got to go to England, because otherwise you're just meandering through mountains for, like, five hours. So it's just like, oh my god, are we in the fucking Lord of the Rings right now? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, though, that's kind of cool. I mean, there's no orcs or anything, but I'm a fan of the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> well, who isn't? Who isn't? I'll tell you who isn't. Anyone who had to see The Hobbit. Yeah, it's funny how that film really, like, polarised people. Some people, like, love The Hobbit and then they're like, eh, the Lord of the Rings. And then the other group are the people who like The Lord of the Rings and they're like, eh, The Hobbit. And you're like, wow, this was uh, a weird little divide that popped up here. I haven't even seen uh, the Battle of the Five Armies. I saw the first two in the cinema, and then I just thought, you know what? I do not care about these movies. I don't care about these characters. I don't care about their journey. I have no emotional attachment to these people whatsoever. So the, the next movie came around, and I just thought, eh, fuck it. I've got other things I want to do, other things I need to see, you know? Is it, well, I, I, mean, I don't even care. That's the worst thing a movie I can do, I think. Because, I mean, there are movies that I love and movies that I like and movies that I dislike and movies that I hate. But mm. the worst thing for me is a movie that I am completely apathetic to. Like, I, yeah. hate, I hate 
Batman versus Superman. But that's <laughs> that is that is a passion of mine. I get passionate when I talk about it and love and hate two sides of the same coin. But mm-hmm. if I don't care about the coin at all, then I am just I don't know, poor. Yeah, well I suppose the coin loses its value then. Exactly. And we realize mm. that money is just a concept that we as humans came up with and our whole society crumbles down upon us. Weren't we talking about comics at one point? Yeah, this got real deep real fast. I mean, we moved from comics to geography to Wales to money to the Battle of the Five Armies to what sounds like an abyss of depression. So let's move on. Let's move on. So what uh, got you into comics in the first place? Oh, wow. Um, Well, I mean, I've always liked reading comics. I mean, everybody has that first comic that they read. I think mine might have been Tintin. And I know I'm not alone in that. Was it one of the racist ones? (laughs) <laughs> you know i feel pretty that's confident. not a no that's not I a no say, i feel pretty confident that it was but as a child i probably didn't notice any of that because i was busy going oh wow look at these cool drawings look at this cute dog but yeah almost definitely i mean tintin's one of those things that you look at it as an adult and you're like whoa 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 what's going on here so but um yeah i think there was that and oh my god what else um like things like the Beano and stuff like that, you know, things that kids read when yeah. you're like five or six and you can buy that from your corner shop. I don't know if you can do that anymore. Wow. Showing the th- age. I, I think like WH Smith or local news agents still stock the Beano. I've seen stuff like that. I had a yeah. subscription to the Beano, I think, at one point. I actually got it through the post. Whoa. Classy. Classy. I like oh, it. Oh, yeah. You think I'm just going to slog all the way to the shop like a plebeian for my Beano? No, 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 no. <laughs> Scott James Merridew gets his Beano through the post like a gentleman. Ooh, la di da. I used my legs. But, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I started off reading stuff like that. But um, in terms of actually making comics... I didn't really start thinking about doing that until I'd finished my degree. Uh, I did my I did my degree in animation and I'd always been interested in animation and drawing. And I bet I was the bane of most of my art teachers lives because high school, they're like paint an orange. And I'm like, hey, have you heard of manga? And they're like, no, stop doing that. Um, Why is this orange so kawaii? I do. <laughs> you know what? I don't understand why you're making 14-year-olds paint oranges in the first place. I mean, come on, man. I mean, out of all the fruits, that's the one that has the least amount of detail to it. Paint an apple. That's got some, depending on the apple, it's got different like colors to it yep. or stuff like mm-hmm. that. Or, I yeah. don't know, a pomegranate? Well, like, yeah, pick something with an interesting shape. Like, I don't know, bananas are not necessarily particularly conventional in terms of fruit shape and then you've got pet whatever the point is um i i started making comics i finished my degree and i started making comics for myself really uh just kind of on the side and um i didn't really think about doing it seriously until my friend sarah who i'm sure you've already met sarah That's- millman Oh yeah, yeah. We, oh, we, 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 we met. We met. Oh, <laughs> of course you have. She knows everybody, which is just amazing. But um, yeah, she, uh, she and I did our masters at the same university, and she spent her masters doing a comic, and I spent mine specialising in storyboarding, which is, I'm sure you can imagine, those two things kind of sit together quite well. There's a Venn and... diagram somewhere out there with those two right. things overlapping. Absolutely. In terms of technique, they are quite similar. Long story short, uh, she found out that I was making comics mainly for myself and invited me to do a a really small Comic-Con event in Cardiff, which is still running today, SICE uh, Comic-Con. Cardiff? uh, Independent Comic Expo. Uh, Yeah, I think David Malofsky went to that. He did. In fact, I saw him there, which is the whole reason that we're having this interview now, because I so offhandedly was like yes, I'm making this book. And he was like, cool, I'll get you in for an interview. And I was like, well, crud, now I really have to make this book because <laughs> I have to go talk about it. Um, oh, shit, so, I'm going to be on pod capers. I'm going to finish this shit. Exactly, yeah. He basically strong-armed me into doing a good job. So thanks for that, Dave. And, um, yeah, we did that event, oh, my God, like 2013, I think. 
uh, and it was really fun and the comics community was really engaging and everyone was really nice and you know like we met people like you guys a place to hang your cape and lots of indie comic artists and to be honest I kind of just felt like man this is so much better than working in an animation studio I'm gonna go do comics so that's a well, very long I think, it, I think it depends on the animation studio yeah but um you know animation super fun really enjoy it i love a good animated film but i have to be honest that uh, i specialized in 2d animation which means drawing the same thing like five thousand times but only in a slightly different position whereas with comics you draw the thing you want to draw and then move on to the next panel and it's very you're in freeing. the moment you're in the moment yes. of the of the scene you capture something it's essence exactly. Yes, uh, you essentially draw what's happening and then you move on to the next thing that's happening and you keep a nice pace and you don't wake up at two in the morning thinking, oh my God, I don't know where those files are. So yeah, it just suited me better, I think, than animation. And after doing a couple of conventions, I decided that I wanted to do comics instead of storyboarding. So that's basically how I started doing it professionally. Yeah, that's that's your journey. So let's talk about uh, the art style. Because I really like the art style and overall and some of the other stuff that I see in your stuff. How did that come about? Was it just like a natural thing or did you work on that specifically? Or Wow. Um, yeah, kind of a bit of both, actually, which I know is a super vague answer. But um, I, it's one of those weird things I know lots of artists struggle with when someone says, oh, I really like your style. And they're like, but I don't have a style. I, I know oh, that I yes, do. Yes, you do. Yes, you <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah, exactly. I always find that really weird when someone says, I don't have a style and you just kind of like stood there looking at them and then looking at their work and then looking at them and being like, um, yeah, I can see it right uh, here. Yeah, yeah, John Romita Jr. I think we can definitely see a pattern developing <laughs> yeah. here. I have eyes. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I made a very conscious effort with my style of drawing to make sure that it was something that I was happy with, but always lent in a new direction. So I think if you've seen any of my work from, oh my God, like five or six years ago, which I'm, I do not encourage anyone to look up. Don't, don't I will feel make the need. it. I will make it my life's mission to uncover these early works. God damn it, Scott. Um, <laughs> but that style of drawing is very, very different from Overlord. And, and it's because... Uh, I always I always do make a conscious effort to try and push my style in new directions. I always look at artists that I really admire their style of drawing or their techniques or I don't know, sometimes with artists I look at them and I just think, man, that's a really cool set of Photoshop brushes. Where did they get them? So, yeah, no, I, I think my style is something, my style of drawing is something that uh, kind of naturally evolves, but there are conscious decisions in there that I've decided to push it this way or push it that way or get better at anatomy or get better with color or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a mix of the two, really. I think that I think that's probably the best way to go about it, speaking from a, a non-artist perspective, simply because, I mean, if you try to just concentrate on developing a style solely and not letting it uh, come out organically, then you might find something that's I mean, okay, but it might not necessarily be you. You might be trying to emulate something or you might be trying to... Yeah. Uh, just, you can't really force it. But if you let it go organically, then there might be not a lot of technique there. It might be sloppy and it might be... Yeah, it might be true and genuine and authentic, but it might not be good. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it, it... Like, you want it to evolve naturally, but you kind of got to nudge it in the right direction. And that involves recognising your own strengths and weaknesses as well. I, I mean, for me... A couple of years back, uh, a lot of the feedback that I was getting was, wow, your characters move really well, but your backgrounds suck. So with Overlord and with a couple of other projects I've worked on since then, backgrounds are something that I've really sort of spent more time on because the feedback I was getting was, you need to work on this thing. OK, cool. I'll do that. I want to be a better artist, so I will focus on that thing. You, you took a bit of construct. Makes... You took a bit of c criticism, and you turn it into something constructive, as any good yeah. artist would do. Well, I mean, you know, if you want to continue working as an artist or get better, which most people I know who do creative things of any kind, be it writing or music or podcasts or whatever, that they want it to grow and and become better. So that involves taking on board criticism, even if you're kind of like, oh man, that stung, but 
this person has a point. I mean, obviously, if someone comes up to you and just goes, hey, your art sucks ass, you're like, great, I can't do anything with that criticism, so I'm going to just ignore it. <laughs> You'll want to talk, Rob Liefeld. <laughs> he's never said that to me, but that that's a general response. <laughs> he, no, he's just, the, he's, he's just the, like the lightning rod for all bad artists out there. He's, he, uh. he's the encapsulation of everything that is wrong with Monday comic book artists. Right, right. But he you gave know, us should... Deadpool, so, you know. Well, I mean, I do like Deadpool. I'm not going to lie. I do, yeah. I do enjoy a bit of the milk with the mouth. What? Who doesn't? Who doesn't? And something else I might ask, I wonder, it's kind of reminded me a little bit of, uh, I don't know if you've seen the webcomic, uh, The Legend of Val. I, you know, I haven't, but you're not the first person to mention this to me. And I think um, the artist for The Legend of Val was at London MCM in May, and I was there as well. And a couple of people came over and said, wow, like, do you guys know each other? Or like, this this kind of has a similar vibe. And I, I've never met the artist for The Legend of Val in my life. And I think maybe I should read their comic or at least well, say you hello definitely, you definitely should because it's an amazing comic the, the only thing yeah. really i noticed was uh it's the noses i mentioned when we had them on the show uh mm. it was a it was a kind of, i call them muppet noses they're just kind of yeah they, they kind of remind <laughs> me of that a little yeah. bit yeah Actually, yeah, sometimes when I draw them, I do have to restrain the muppetiness because there have been one or two uh, drafts of those pages where I've had to go back in and fix everyone's noses because I was clearly tired and everyone's sort of shrunk from being a humanoid to being a puppet version of themselves. But um, yeah, I think for me, that style of drawing the noses uh, kind of came about because at the time when I was developing the characters for Overlord, I was watching a Let's Play of... Um, Legend of Zelda Wind Waker and ah. I noticed some of the characters had these noses and I was like oh that's kind of cool I'll try that out I'll see if that works for me and it fitted in with the style I was working with at the time so I ran with it but um, also any artist can tell you that drawing noses is a pain in the ass noses like hands are notoriously difficult to get right so when it's a shape sometimes you kind of feel like you know what you're doing. <laughs> this is why so many anime characters don't have noses. Yes, it's exactly why they don't have noses. And also why their lower jaw doesn't move when they're talking. Watch out for that next time. What's going on there, guys? <laughs> well, you, well you, you've ruined anime for me now. Jeez. I know. <laughs> Damn to be it, honest... that makes so many things make sense now. It, the <laughs> mouth moves, but the lower jaw doesn't. Ah, right. <laughs> oh, oh, God, Krillin is an abomination. I've shown you a peek behind the curtain. This is what happens when you study animation. You notice nonsense like that, and then you find yourself kind of going, oh, no, now I can't enjoy this because all I can see is this structural problem with this character. Oh, mm -mm. Knowledge is a oh. curse. It is powerful but cursy. <sighs> so I think we should find it. Fine, let's start talking about Overlord. Now, full disclosure, Capers, I've only read, a, as uh, Sean said, a... Um, 25 page a preview but the little i read was very interesting so let's just give us a could you give us a brief brief background on overlord what's it about okay well overlord is um oh my god page count at the moment it's 168 page graphic novel uh and essentially it's about a guy who accidentally becomes an evil overlord you know like you do it's been Happens there to everybody at no, least we, I, think we, I think we've all been yeah. there yeah Exactly. Um, and essentially, the story follows <laughs> follows his progress as he's trying to walk this fine line between pretending to be an overlord, not actually doing anything evil, which is much harder than it sounds, and not getting killed by overzealous heroes. Because this is set in the type of fantasy world where if an evil overlord pops up, suddenly every hero within a 50 mile radius is like hey i'm gonna go slay the overlord and essentially it kind of follows him trying to deal with all of this um but the underlying situation is that there is something else going on and he's trying to balance all of this stuff and it all snowballs and i can't tell you too much because i don't want to ruin the end but 
there's a lot of sword fighting and stuff gets set on fire and there are minions that looks like bats and everyone's sarcastic. So if that's your kind of thing, please check out Overlord because I might have the book for you. <laughs> well, that that's the thing, you see, because reading the preview, uh, the humour in particular really spoke to me. I think this is probably one of the... I mean, I've read a lot of uh, funny uh, comics and doing pod capers and just in general. This is probably the... Uh, the the uh, this is this is a comic that speaks the most to me in terms of humor i think probably overall it, it, oh. I, just because I, I don't know the way the jokes are told and the sort of the sort of the tongue-in-cheek humor i don't know it's just like there's a little side bit with like just describing all the heroes from this place called heroesville or heroes town whatever it's called and mm -hmm. uh there's like people doing fighting people and fighting dragons and there's a dragon like sort of curled around a tower with a princess in it who's just like oh <laughs> and the dragon is like come at me bro I, <laughs> yeah i just find that hilarious and th there's so many jokes in it. like like there's there's a person who is hung out outside the town walls for being a witch because her name is i.r witcherson and she's yeah. just an old lady and she's just like she lives there now and she's got doilies yeah. and stuff and she sleeps there and everything and she's just and that just that's just hilarious. I that, that I I have a kind of I think I have an eclectic sense of humor. It really does depend on the moment of what I like. But yeah. if we're going for broad overview, this is my kind of humor. Yeah, oh well, I'm so pleased to hear that because honestly most of those jokes uh this sounds really egotistical and a bit wanky but i wrote them for myself because they made me laugh so it's quite that, satisfying to hear that they made you laugh as well but that's the thing you see that's the thing it's some of the best pieces of media have been made because someone really liked that thing and wanted to do it a bit for themselves yeah media when you put it out there it becomes less about you and more about everyone but it, that leads to a place of uh authenticity again it's like star wars was made because that was the kind of movie george lucas wanted to see and it became yeah. a movie that we all wanted to see in that case so it, it, it works because i mean uh, we're all individuals we all have individual tastes but a lot of time we share tastes so if you make something that you think you're like there's a chance that other people will like it too. There's also a chance it will backfire horribly and it'll be mm -hmm. just something you like and then uh, then no one else likes it at all. Or if they do like it, it's not for the same reasons, Tommy Wiseau. But still, uh, that's, not a, that's not the case here, <laughs> thankfully. Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more. And I think particularly when you do something creative, uh, a lot of people find that they feel a bit... Um, overwhelmed with creating for others so i always try to keep an element of creating for myself when i make a comic or a character or whatever i'm making because i feel like if i'm making it for myself first that's much more satisfying but also there are over seven billion people on the planet somebody else is probably going to enjoy this even if it is only one other person i'm just imagining so... like a chinese rice paddy farmer just reading a comic and just like ha this guy gets me. Exactly, right? I mean, comics are such a good way of reaching out to other people in terms of sense of humor or stories or character representation and just saying, hey, you're not on your own because someone else made this and it speaks to you and it it also speaks to them as the creator. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. Make stuff for yourself and other people will like it or they won't. But, you know, if you're your first customer, then... It's already a success. Hmm. So why did you want to make it for yourself? What prompted you to make Overlord specifically? Oh, well, I think... I'm really giving uh, you some tough questions, aren't I? Yeah, it's, uh, I have not had enough coffee. Um, uh, to be honest, with Overlord, I was really interested in this whole idea of um, seeing things in extremes. Because obviously, at the moment, like, the digital society we live in it tends to be very sort of yes or no or black mm. or white there's no middle ground no blue or yellow exactly blue or yellow red or green there's like yanni or laurel there's, <laughs> there's very little room for maneuver and i think it's like it's kind of dangerous to look at the world in just negatives and positives I, excuse me excuse me i look in the world in red and blue and that works out fine for me 
yeah, I can see that from your glasses logo. But my point is that there will be things that you are willing to think about and not just go, this is a yes or a no. Mm. Um, and that's the whole premise of your show. We're having a conversation about it now. But yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, jokes aside, that is my personal philosophy. The whole reason why I wear the red and blue glasses is because I want both of these things come together to form a sort of middle ground as it were positively and negatively you can't just as you say jump from one extreme to the other you have to uh balance it out it's a balancing act exactly and um i i remember as a kid reading stories that were always divided by you know this character's good this character's evil uh but the characters that always really interested me were the ones that weren't either in terms of i guess in terms of like uh, this is super nerdy in terms of D and D alignments, the characters that sit in true neutral and can do anything, they can be good or evil. So for me, I wanted to write a story about a character who isn't either and, and doesn't fit into either stereotypical extreme, but lives in a world where everyone else does. And this sort of fantasy world seemed like the best way to do that. So, well, that was the time so in the medieval. That's kind of where it came from, and then it built up from there. Yeah, well, that, that makes perfect sense because in the medieval society, leaving aside fantasy, you could there weren't a lot of options. Let me put it that way. You you had to be yeah. the originally defined roles, and some of which still mm -hmm. sadly linger in our society right now. Yeah, and it's very hard to get out of them. And and that's the great thing I like yeah. about this because based on what I've seen in the uh, preview. Uh, yeah, he's kind of neutral and he's surrounded by people who are one thing or another thing and he's not really much of any of those things, but he's still mm -hmm. a character. He's not a blank slate. Absolutely. And that's the point is that a, a well-rounded out person or a real person, they can't just be one thing or the other and they can't fit into a box. And like you were saying about medieval society has very rigid roles. In some ways, our own societies have very... Uh, not rigid, but expectations of certain types of people because of the way that they dress or the way that they look or their sexual orientation or their job or whatever. The, and... the big thing, the big thing, actually, I noticed when I was uh, scrolling through your Tumblr, because, uh, mm. you know, stalker, oh, and, uh, yep. <laughs> no, and I saw this post you had, I don't know if you did or someone else did it, but it was about uh, how this kid in school I had to talk about a character that he really looked up to. And he said Matilda from the book and the movie Matilda. And she was like, you can't yeah. like Matilda. She's a girl mm -hmm. character. Wouldn't you rather pick a boy character? And mm -hmm. the, the gender is the big thing right now. Yeah. There's all these expectations. And the way we view both femininity and masculinity or something other than femininity or masculinity, because there are other genders out there, is sure. so ridiculous. You know what? You know what? I could put on a flowery gingham dress and skip daintily through a field of meadows while singing Oh What a Beautiful Morning and I would still be a fucking man! Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, in the same way that I draw comics for a living, I also really enjoy weightlifting. It doesn't make me any less of a woman because I pursue something that is... Well, my job is in a male-dominated industry, although that's changing, and I enjoy sports that mostly you have to muscle dudes off of the rack to use. But that doesn't really a affect my gender identity if that exactly, makes sense exactly women can be buff women can have muscle i mean for god's sake my mum is a you know pe teacher among the many other teaching stuff she does and my sister is a professional athlete mm -hmm. so, yeah so i i learned very quickly growing up yeah women can do these sorts of things and it, it's the, the fact i hate the fact that i grew up in a society that maybe questioned those things in the first place because i did have to question it i was mm -hmm. brought up sure and that's the, actually that's the worst thing about it i was never told Women do these sort of things, men do these sort of things. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was what bled in through the society. It's all connotations and subterfuges. It's very insidious. And there are examples mm. in our society and other societies where people are given very rigidly defined roles. They say, no, no, girls don't like these things. They like these things. And boys don't like things. They like other things. But uh, for the most part, it's far, far more... I guess I'm going to call it what it is, evil in the way. It just mm. sort of slowly bleeds into our psyches and our sure. collective subconscious. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think even though nobody's sitting you down and saying, OK, so you're a lady, that means you've got to be into babies and cooking, there is that weird sort of expectation or... Uh, 
it like you said it does bleed through and part of what I wanted to do with this book was really highlight for people who may be struggling with this because I think everybody does in terms of you know who am I what am I doing am I doing it right that it's okay to not fit into a like a box because you're not supposed to be in the box anyway if that makes sense no absolutely so, and that and that's what I really wanted to do with this character was go, well, he lives in this world of good and evil and he doesn't fit into either of those categories and that's fine. Yeah. Um of course it's but, fine. Yeah, of course it is. And I, I like I think I feel quite lucky that I'm quite confident in I <laughs> am I allowed to swear? You you can fucking swear as much as you fucking <laughs> like. Excellent. Oh, God, I've never said that word on this show before. I'm going to get in so much trouble. (laughs) You're about to be edited. Um, But, yeah, I I feel quite lucky that I'm at a point in my life where I'd say 90 percent, 90 to 95 percent of the time, I don't really give a fuck what other people think of me in terms of how I look or the things that I pursue, because the interests that I have, they're not hurting anybody. They're not upsetting anybody. I'm not stealing money from anyone. But I think there are a lot of people out there, particularly people from, uh, well, I was going to say minority groups, but that's bullshit because they're not minority groups. They're just other. But, you know, you have young women and members of the LGBT plus community, a differently abled people, people of color who this is something that these groups have struggled with for quite a while and they struggle with them for the same reason that everybody struggles with them, that society says, oh, well, you fit into this box, so these are the things you should do. And I wanted to write a character that would sort of speak to them or speak to people who are struggling with fitting into expectations because that sucks. (laughs) Yeah, I mean... Yeah, it, it does. I mean, I remember uh, talking about people not telling me this sort of thing, but actually there was an instance where someone did tell me. Uh, no, this thing, my mum is my fucking hero. She's great. She's one of the re- many reasons why I'm a feminist. But there was one time where, uh, I don't know why, I was slightly young and we were just talking about, you know, those sort of things. And she said, there are differences be- between guys and girls. And I said, well, yeah, but not that many differences. It's not really that big of a deal. But she's just like... Well, Scott, you know, if you picked up a stick, for you it would be a sword. For a girl, it would be a wand. I was like, well, for a lot of guys, yes. For a lot of girls, yes. But for some guys, it might be a wand. For some girls, it might be a sword. You can't... I was one of those. (laughs) Yeah! Yeah! It's like, hello, fucking Wonder Woman people! Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I think... Yeah, I think it's just pointing out that... Okay, if you want the stick to be a wand... That's fine. But it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl or anything in between. Like, just be yourself. Just do you do you. You do you. And it it gets worse when there's so much backlash. And there is a lot of backlash now. Because two things I've noticed in recent things. Specifically, I want to bring it back to animation. Uh, Hmm. There's a a new uh, She-Ra cartoon coming out. Apparently there's a lot of backlash about that. People didn't like the art style. People didn't like the thing. I saw the trailer for it and it looked fucking awesome. It was only a little thing, but it looked looked really cool. It's something I might might check out. And there's also um, an anime done by Crunchyroll. I think it's the first anime they're doing. Uh, It's Mm. like full female crew making it, mainly female cast. I can't remember what it's called. Something Spice. And... uh, I watched, uh, I watched a few videos of it because I thought, oh, apparently people who don't really like it, I want to find out why. And mm. a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it was just complaints that it was an all-female crew and... Th- there is a, well, there was... They weren't even complaints like, oh, because I hate women. It was done like in a sort of like, oh, social justice warrior thing, which I hate has been turned into yeah. a negative thing. But it's mainly just like, okay, but we don't really know anything about this anime... They haven't released mm-hmm. even a trailer for it. They've talked about it a bit. They talk yeah. about how good it's going to be and how uh, it's going to be good just for society. And yeah, maybe that is jumping the gun a bit. But because, I mean, mm-hmm. my personal philosophy, again, another personal philosophy is if you have something that is progressive and includes representation and opportunities and stuff like that, that is good. That is undeniably a good thing, but it won't make a p- individual piece of media 
better or worse. It will just make it more meaningful and more important to an individual who reads it. It won't necessarily affect the quality, but it won't mm-hmm. necessarily take away from the quality either. It won't make something bad or good. It will just make it more meaningful. Black Panther wasn't good because it had had so many uh, black actors and a black cast and black characters. It was good because it was well written and well directed and well acted. It was just the fact that it had such diversity in it was just important for people and what we needed as a society. And Mm -hmm. you can't really complain about that, I don't think. You can complain if a show's good or bad, but that's yeah. the whole progressive thing and the whole giving opportunities and representation doesn't really enter into it. And especially, especially when a show hasn't even come out yet. The, the yeah, people, I... people, people were making like 40 minute videos about how this show sucks and no one has even seen a single episode of it. It's crazy. Yeah, I agree. I've been following the She-Ra um... <laughs> I've been following the she release online mainly because I was quite interested in watching it it looked nice i saw the trailer for it i think it's coming out on november 16th on netflix um and i only know that because i happen to not be here on november 16th so i was like oh my god put that in my phone but um yeah i i thought that was really odd with shira because first of all all these people kind of coming out of the work and out of the woodwork sorry and and saying oh they're remaking Shira and it's ruined my childhood uh okay but you're How? not yeah you're not a kid this isn't being made for you uh or at least you're not the target audience and the fact that they're remaking it doesn't mean that the original episodes of Shira or the original Shira content suddenly magically does not exist anymore. So if you don't like the new stuff, that's fine. It's okay for you to not like it, but maybe then just don't watch it. Uh, it's it's seems the, Ray- like the most obvious solution to me. It, exactly, it's it's the Raymond Chandler thing. Someone once told uh, Raymond Chandler uh, after several movies of his books have been made, is just like, hey, so what do you think about all these movies are uh, ruining your books and ruining your stories? And he just said, come with me. And he took them into his library and, and pointed at his books and said, they're my stories. They're there. They're fine. Mm. The movies didn't ruin them. They were just bad yeah. movies. I mean, he apparently didn't like the movies. Uh, I think they're fine, but the point. But the point yeah. is, like, more recent example. I watched Spider-Man cartoons when I was a kid. The new ones are mm-hmm. fucking atrocious. They are dreck. They are <laughs> dribble, and I hate them. They don't <laughs> ruin the original shows. Going back and no. watching the original no. shows ruins the original shows because if you watch ninety Spider-Man now, you realise, my God, he talks a lot. Yeah, yeah, like all the time. It's a non-stop barrage. But yes, yeah, I agree, and I think. I think it's just, it's it's weird. And I also don't understand why, if you don't like a show, then the next step is to attack the creator because they are, I can only assume, different from the attacker. It seems I mean, really I, weird. It, it is really, really weird. I mean, I don't like M. Night Shyamalan, but I don't dislike him because he's not white. I dislike him because he made fucking Last Air Benjamin. It was awful. You know, I'm sure M. Night Shyamalan is a nice person. Personally, though, the last Airbender film made me want to throw things out the window. But, you know, I don't have anything against M. Night Shyamalan because he made a bad movie. Everybody makes mistakes every now and again. But going back to She-Ra, the fact that the... Who is it? The director or the showrunner or whatever. Like, okay, she's got short hair and she dates women really has nothing to do with her ability to direct a good remake of a show that actually looks like it's going to be quite enjoyable to watch. So why? Why Why would you even pursue that line? There's, 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 there are so many things in this world that people don't care about, that they should care about. This is not one of those things. This is one of the things <laughs> yeah. you shouldn't care about. Care about whether the show is good or not. Don't care about whether or not the person who makes it dates women because that is irrelevant. It is so irrelevant. My gender identity, my sexuality is completely irrelevant to this show. I don't... Mm-hmm. Ma- I mean, okay, maybe if I was gay or if I was LGBTQIA plus or whatever, or if I wasn't white, maybe that might 
inform my perspective in some way or another because that does mm-hmm. happen and that's fine. But mm. ultimately, I think I would still be the same person. I would still be a ridiculous, shouty weirdo. That wouldn't change. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And it has no bearing whatsoever on your ability to create. So, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I, uh, the Internet, I it's, it's go a double on edged it very sword. selectively. Yeah, yes. A... Oh, my God, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you never be careful, kids, when going on the Internet, because there are many wondrous things out there. But sometimes you turn the wrong corner and boom, there's a guy with red and blue glasses shouting about Suicide Squad. But anyway, yes. Exactly. You just need to know what you're getting into. <laughs> going back to Overlord, we were talking about that at one point. Oh, the yeah. thing I do want to talk about is the use of colour. I like my colourful comics, I really do. Mm, and yeah. uh, not a lot of colour in the preview that I saw. Yes, yeah. Um, there, <laughs> there's a super selfish reason for that. Um, colour is expensive. My... Well, colour is expensive, which I'm not particularly bothered about because a full, I, I agree with you, a full colour comic, oh, it's beautiful. I love to see lots of colours on a page. And I think for lots of artists that I have the books and I enjoy their work and I follow them online, some of them are just great with colour. Um, Overlord, I wanted to try working with a limited colour palette because everything I'd done before Overlord was full colour. Mm. And I enjoy working in full colour, but it takes up a lot of time and I'm a one woman operation and for a book, the size of overlord, uh, it was going to extend my production time by a lot. And I sort of felt the combination of wanting to try a new coloring technique and wanting to get this book finished and printed and available for people to physically hold in their hands because I'm a really big big fan of owning physical copies of books and DVDs and music and things um, Mm. kind of pushed me to make the decision to go with a more limited color palette it is new territory for me but I do understand that it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea, which is why when it came to the cover design I was absolutely adamant that the cover would reflect the interior content because my pet peeve with comics sometimes is you have this really beautifully colored amazing looking cover and then you open it and the interior will have like three colored pages and then the rest of the book is in black and white and a little part of me feels like I understand this is a lot of work but I really wanted to see this in color so it's like it's like they're lying it's a bit of a betrayal almost it's it's, yeah you're, you're presenting something in one way and mm-hmm. then you reveal, like, it's like if someone gave you a lovely box of chocolate and the and the outside was, like, encrusted with gold and wrapped in the <laughs> finest of ribbons and it was embroidered delicately and on the cover of the box it was calligraphied with, I love you, you are my deepest passion and these are for you. And you open mm. it and it's just like spiders. Yes. Well, maybe not spiders, but, like, they've eaten most of the chocolates and only left... Um the freaking Turkish delight, which I hate. So, <gasps> How like, dare you? <coughs> thing with marzipan on. I'm sorry. That's just, it's just my opinion. It's okay. We don't, we don't need to kill each other over it or send each other threatening tweets. But you know, um, yeah. You're lucky it, it, I'm it, not on Twitter. <laughs> I'm lucky I'm talking to you face to face right now, so you can't tweet at me. But um, yeah, yeah, I, it is a bit like that so with overlord even though i'd chosen to do this limited color palette i did make the conscious decision that the cover would reflect the interior of the book so that i didn't accidentally give people a gold encrusted box of spiders yeah well thank you thank you for doing it but one thing i did like about the color was mm. uh not that i didn't like the lack of the uh, uh limited color palette but it's, it's just a case of one thing i thought that actually did work in its favor was uh kit the main character. Mm. I'm, just gonna, mm-hmm. I'm just gonna tell you about this right now. He can use magic. Yeah, in fact, you find that out in like the first five pages, I think. Yes, yeah, so it's not really uh, a spoiler, I don't think. No, but it's not being, at all a spoiler. <laughs> when he uses magic, that's very colourful. It really stands out. Yes. Um initially I wasn't going to do that, and I was looking at the colour testers for the page. 
and I felt like the magic was getting lost, which seemed really backward to me because magic is a wondrous thing that we can't explain. So why is it being lost in this page of color? Uh, so I decided to give each character, this is not a spoiler, but shocker, there's more than one type of magic in this world, can use magic, uh, they're color coded. So the magic is the only thing that really pops off the page. And I think uh, in the preview that I gave you, he blows up a tower with it. Mm. So a it's tower not... that he's got it, it was like an exam thing to be a hero and yeah. he's got to rescue the princess which is like a guy with a beard and a princess dress it's awesome and <laughs> uh how does he do it he unlocks the door it's like yeah. why has no one else tried this exactly <laughs> yeah it's it's the kind of solution that anybody from our world would think oh I'll try the door, but if you live in a town full of heroes, their first response is, I'll scale the tower and rescue your fair maiden. It's like, or you could check that she hasn't locked herself in. There's that too. You are creating too much work for yourself, Lancelot. Exactly. Why are you climbing up the outside of a round tower in full armor? But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, the magic, I really just, I wanted it to pop off of the page and I wanted it to look like, it was something other than the environments that the characters were in. And later on in the book, it is going to start uh, coming through a lot more in later scenes when we move to the more overlord central sort of centric scenes. There will be more magic later on. So, Ooh. And will uh -huh. we, the main thing I want to know is, will we see more of Ivor? Yes. Yeah. Ivor is, um, he pops up consistently throughout the book and at one point the story kind of jumps between what he's doing and what kit's doing because obviously with kit accidentally becoming an evil overlord which is the premise of the whole book it kind of puts them on opposite sides uh and am i, am I right are... am i right in thinking there's a little bit of a dragon there a little bit a little bit of hearting going on yeah. Oh my, you, yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. I mean, one of the things that I really wanted to put into Kit as a character is that he is the most awkward little duck. He's super Aww. awkward. Oh he's my a God, he's a little woobie. blushy baby. He's, he's a wooby. <laughs> but th that will, we will sort of see more of that later on and Ivor will pop up throughout the book. But th there's going to be a few little tensions there because obviously Ivor's a hero and Kit is going to become an overlord. So, Oh, I there's... ship it. I ship it so hard. Yay! <laughs> so, uh, there's a Kickstarter coming out for Overlord, is there not? Yes, it is launching in two days on September 20th and I'm super nervous slash excited. So, uh, yeah, that will be launching on September 20th. There's a whole bunch of rewards for it. Um, let me have a think. I think we've got like a, a quite a wide variety. So there's a mention on the thank you page. You can get PDF copies of the book if you prefer digital. There are physical copies available. We're doing a run of limited edition prints. So artwork of characters and scenery and things like that. And I think the highest tier has the opportunity for a custom piece of artwork where I will draw you as an evil overlord in full armor and everything. So, uh, yeah, there's, and, uh, how, how there's much, a whole how, bunch of fun stuff to get. How much would that cost if I'm just asking for a friend? I'm, I, don't, I don't fantasize myself as an evil dictator ruling over all the land. <laughs> well, you can tell your friend that the highest tier is 50 50 pounds the lowest tier i believe oh my god i i don't have my tier list in front of me i think the lowest tier is about five pounds um mm -hmm. but there might be a one pound tier as well i think there is a one pound tier but i tried to give it as much variety as possible so that if you want to support the book but you know not everyone's made of money i know i'm not you can either pledge lower or higher or whatever suits you or if you i think a copy of the book is a 15 pound tier so there's lots of yeah. options for you people to enjoy um, yeah and so what where do you think overlord is going to go is it just is this going to be like a one and done sort of thing what's the future of overlord 
Overlord is a self-contained graphic novel um, because I did try working. I, I've worked on series of comics before and I really enjoyed it. But I think one of the things that I consistently felt and I think readers of those series felt was that you never really got to know how the story ended, if you missed an issue or blah, blah, blah. So with Overlord, I decided, nope, we're going to put the whole story in one completed book so that if you buy it or back it or whatever, you get the whole thing. You get to see how the story ends and what happens with these characters. So it is a self-contained graphic novel. It may be something that I think about writing a sequel to later, but for now, it's a one and done. Because you have done ongoing work in the past. I have, yeah. Uh, I did a webcomic series that went to print uh, The Book of Faye, which is currently on hiatus because Overlord has just eaten the last year and a half of my life. Um, and I also have a short series, uh, The Adventures of Sush, which is just a short diary comic about my super cute and super dumb cat. <laughs> so many people so... writing comics about their cats. Oh, my God. I know. Well, they are an endless source of weird reference and inspiration. And honestly, it's not normally the kind of thing that I would have done. But I adopted this cat and she is the weirdest pet I've ever had in my life. And I love her to bits, but she just does the most bizarre stuff. So I decided I should probably start writing it down, at least for future archaeologists to understand what the hell went down. So, And at one point, the person who lived in this crumbling ruin owned some sort of animal, and this animal would bring in other animals from outside that were, she, it had killed and place them in its o owner's mouth while they slept. Exactly. We know from the devastation that this animal was extremely powerful and extremely dumb. But... Um... <laughs> You did, a, yeah. you, did a, you did another cat-related thing called Fearless, didn't you? Ah, yes. Fearless um, is my... It's a diary comic, again, but it's an online diary comic that I run through my Patreon, and it's really nothing to do with my actual cat. But I, I started doing a diary comic in which I drew everybody as animals. Just, I, I, don't, I don't really know why. I suppose that says it's more what, I, about that... me... No, not really, because I mean, I, I've, I've done that as well. Sometimes you associate yeah. people with different animals just by their look or their temperament or their personalities mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It is yeah. just, it's something people do. I remember, um, what was it? Uh, oh, I think it was a. No, I oh, yes, I think it was um, the original book of The Queen's Nose. If I remember, oh, correctly, yeah. Red Winter Kid. The main character in that imagined her uh, family members as like big animals. Very yes yeah no oh my god i remember that, that tv series that was on like bbc or cbbc they, they, yeah they made it into a tv no. series later uh, on where there's just like I this magic that. 50 pence piece just goes around yeah. to kids and they keep on making wishes and they end up like sometimes breaking the laws of space and time yes yeah no oh my god i remember that and there was another one as well um bernard's watch that i remember watching that yes! and being like Whoa. You cannot <laughs> give a kid a watch that can stop time. Yeah, and not expect them to massively abuse that power because I would. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest, Capers. I think I'm a decent, upstanding, moral citizen. But if someone gave me the ability to stop time, I would steal everything. I, w I would yeah, go I mean... to shops and I would steal DVDs and video games and food and all sorts. And I would live like a king. Yeah, I mean, I, like, I can't talk. I wrote a book about being an evil overlord, so I would obviously do that. You know, <laughs> you can stop time and do whatever you want. Uh, yes, please. Sounds great. Why are we giving this watch to a 12-year-old? Give it to an adult. Yeah, there were, a lot, there were a lot of, like, in the 90s, early 2000s, a lot of live-action TV shows with, like, I don't know, like, magical realism stuff having to, happening to kids, and they were actually kind of interesting. Mm, we were mm -hmm. talking about comics at one point. I don't know what happened. Uh, oh God, yeah. You also did, you've done um, you've done lots of individual artworks, including some promotional art for NPCT. Yes, yeah, I did a promotional print for I think it was issue three of NPCT, uh, which is Sarah's uh, current running series. I think she's just finished issue five of that, which I'm really excited to look at because she did send me a little sneak preview 
we do occasionally send each other work so that we can just make sure that we're not completely losing our minds and that it is actually legible and things. And it looks so good. So if you are following MPCT, uh, keep an eye out for that. I'm pretty sure it's going to be at Thought Bubble, which is this weekend. But mm. it's exciting. And uh, yeah, I've so done you're going, are, you, are you going to Thought Bubble then? Yes. Yeah, I will be at Thought Bubble. I'm going to be in uh, Victoria Hall, the really fancy one with all the woohoo Ooh. Imperial. Um, it's got like it's very Victorian on the inside, and there's all these weird like scrolling bits of carving that are like, oh, isn't the British Empire the best? And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to be in there. I'm at table 52A. You probably won't miss us though because there's a whole row of people that i know we're all like next to each other this year so it's going to be loud and fun and i think we're all going to be having a very good time and there's going to be comics there's going to be so many great comics there so really a thought thought bubble bubble, i mean are there going to be that many comics a thought bubble Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm excited. Like loads of people that I'm following on Twitter have been posting about things that they're taking to Thought Bubble. And some people that I know personally have got new stuff coming out. So I'm technically, I'm going there to work, but I have a feeling I'm going to come back with a stack of comics and no money. So yeah. But that's what happens whenever I go to a con. I got issue four of NPCT uh, at Meanwhile Comic Con where I met Sarah and we went up. Uh, we did a live podcast together, so we, th- th- this this can happen. This can yeah, happen. Absolutely. <laughs> Although I spend, I tend to spend most of my money on on cons on badges. I just like badges. I get so many badges. Yeah. I got Pokemon badges last time. All the Pokemon badges. I've been to Ooh, all nice. the gyms. I was gonna say, did you get the gym badges or did you get Pokemon as in actual Pokemon badges, like specific Pokemon? No, literally, like the the, uh, the water badge, the lightning badge, the earth badge, and stuff like that. Oh, nice! Because those are actually kind of hard to find, and I think they're more expensive than your average. I got a Pikachu badge, so I, that's. I, 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 I also did get a Pikachu badge, but uh, literally, uh, it, it, it's <laughs> it, it, they're, they're metal. They've got like stud backs, and it's it's uh, they they they, they cost me a, a little bit, but worth it. Oh, yes. Worth are they it. like? the original gym badges or are you a specific series of pokemon fan kanto region forever and always johto can fuck off sino i don't care <laughs> it's, it's like uh don't care pokemon red blue and yellow thank you very much although i have i have played silver on the gate boy color but um yeah. I, I think i was talking about this before i got it in france on a school trip because i thought well i'll just change it to english in the options there was no nope. such option I got nope. like halfway <laughs> through the game, not understanding what the fuck was going on. I, 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 had, I had to give up because there was a guy blocking my path and I didn't know how to get past him. And he just kept telling me to hop. What? I, I, I literally okay. he just kept saying hop, 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 hop. And I was just like, I, I, don't, I, I don't understand what that means. Yeah, or how to actually do that in the context of that game. Mm. Wow. That's, but uh... one game, one game I've been playing recently that is... Mm rather good Mm. is spider-man ps4 oh i've heard so many amazing things about this game it's so fucking 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 good (laughs) i i'm told that the web swinging mechanic in this game is I, like what was the last one that everyone was like, wow, they really nailed like the web uh, swinging. I that think was it's like Spider Man Two. That, no, that was Web of Shadows. Web of Shadows did pretty good on the web swinging. It wasn't as good as Spider Man Two, yeah. but you know it was up there. It was definitely uh-huh. a, a very close second, I think. And they yeah. that uh, that's made up for it by having a lot of a uh, really nice uh, movement options and also great. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, you could fight in the air, you could fight in the ground, you could fight on the walls, which had never been done before. And it was Ooh. it was a lot of fun, and it added stuff for the black suit. But that's a uh, that's a whole other thing. The thing with the uh, web swinging in uh, mechanic in uh, Spider-Man PS4 is mm. uh, it's one of those things where if you're watching a video of it, and I know because I watched a lot of videos pro- of it prior to getting it, mm-hmm. you never really know what it's going to feel like. You can see how it looks. It looks a lot of fun. But mm-hmm. this is probably the best web swinging mechanic we've got because mm. it combines practicality 
versatility, moveability, traversability, and just a generally good feel all mm. in one go. So you look good, you feel good, and you have free range of movement and can easily control where Spider-Man goes as you're going to it. It's one of those things, though, that the minute you start playing, and it really does drop you in the deep end right from the get-go, uh, yeah. it's very... Not unintuitive necessarily, but it's one of those things where you will have some take some time to get used to it. You think it's going to be one yeah. way. It's not. It's difficult to talk about. It's difficult to explain. Mm. It's one of the things where you literally just have to play it to uh, understand what I'm talking about. That's one of the things, unfortunately, you could never really get from a video or someone talking about it on a podcast. Yeah. But once you get it, and you will get it fairly quickly, a couple of missions in, it becomes second nature. And it's just, it's so awesome. It's so much fun just to swim swing around and yeah it's and oh my god there's so much in this game there is so much to do the way you progress the way you level up the characters the characters oh my god mj and peter are so cute i just want to wrap them up in a little bow and hug them (laughs) <laughs> I um I've seen that you can get a variety of different suits as well including the Iron Spider which initially I was a bit like uh it's a Spider-Man game do you really want to be messing around with that iconic suit but um yeah you do because these other suits have some really cool perks I'm not going to lie oh, the yeah. Iron Spider suit with the extra four arms I watched a video of somebody in I think it was combat on the ground so not swinging around but these extra four arms are legit like picking people up and throwing shit around and like blocking stuff. And I was like, what? Like they actually put the arms for the iron spider suit in and you can use them. That's pretty cool. There, there's so many little details about this game that you don't even notice. Like, I don't know if you've seen this, but um, there's a, there's a point where Spider-Man's original suit gets damaged and it's just like, well, I better fix my suit. Don't let anyone mm-hmm. see my three chest hairs. If you can unlock a, you can unlock a suit later on, which is Peter Parker in nothing but his Spider-Man mask and his boxers, mm-hmm. and if you use photo mode, there's a photo mode to zoom in on Peter Parker's chest, you will see three chest hairs. <laughs> That's such a great little detail. It's, oh my gosh! It's it's little things like that. About the suit I just unlocked the Spider-Man 2099 version which is so cool and it's so much fun to play as. And mm-hmm. uh, there's so many side missions and collectibles and stuff, but you do, it's not like busy work. You enjoy swinging around the city, collecting pigeons yeah. and backpacks and all sorts of things. And, you, and they keep little things to keep you interested, like this Daily Bugle newspapers and J. Jonah Jameson with his little uh, oh my Alex God, yeah. Jones-esque uh, radio web bursts and... It's, I, they really nailed the character of J. Jonah Jameson. They really got his like crusading sort of thing. But they understood the character in that he's not an evil person. He believes he's on the side of good. He's trying to do a public service. He's a bit of an egomaniac. But he does care about the city and he does care about people and he wants things to be okay. He just thinks that Spider-Man is not okay. Yeah, and I I don't know how far you in how far into the game you are, but um that's sort of ramps up the further in you get and the more extreme things become and like the more the situation in the game escalates uh jj is there the whole time being like spider-man 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 and it's it really does add to this sense of wow this has become a really high pressure crazy situation that spider-man has to sort out um and i won't spoil any of it for you but it's awesome you know. Yeah, it is also. Awesome. I'm a, I'm at a level thirty right now. I I won't spoil anything either. But it it I mean, God, there's just there's so much more of the game left to play, and there's so much stuff to do. And it's yeah. just uh, it's one of those things where it's so much fun. Bit expensive right now. I mm-hmm. I, will, I will say I I had a bit of extra money this month, so I I treated myself. I think I'm allowed. <laughs> I, I work yourself. hard. Damn. Treat yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, and. It's one of those things where, should I wait, should I wait, should I wait? I should probably wait. But then I remembered, wait a minute, I have waited. I've waited years for this game. I've waited Mm -hmm. pretty much since Web of Shadows, if not Spider-Man 2. I wanted to get at the Amazing Spider-Man games, even though I hate those movies. Then I found out how shit they were and I didn't bother. And I I had to sit through two Beanox games that are fine, I guess. They're serviceable, but I don't really care about them. 
And it's just like, you know, I deserve this. I fucking deserve this. I did my waiting! Years of it! <laughs> in Azkaban! Uh... Yeah, well, I think there are lots of people who feel the same because, I mean, a, a bunch of friends of mine have bought the game. One of them, this jammy little bastard, he put a photo up on Facebook and he's like, look at my new PS4. He's got the Spider-Man PS4 with the game and the collectible figure. And I was like, I'm so happy for you. And boy, do I want to punch you in the throat right now. But, you um, rich bastard. Yeah, I was just like, you, you know, that's awesome. And I would never take it away from you, but I want to play Good that. Good for you. I'm so happy for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, loads of people I know have said, I've, re I've been waiting ages for this game because the last game that they really enjoyed was Web of Shadows or Spider-Man 2. And this game seems to be ticking all the boxes, not to mention one of the things that I noticed from watching videos of it the voice acting is on point. It oh. is really enjoyable listening to these characters talk to each other. Like you said with Peter and MJ, that's adorable. Peter talking to police officers, civilians, Aunt May, um, any of the villains that you end up encountering. It's all really well written and enjoyable to listen to. And it pushes the story forward and is well acted. So It's so well combined it with some brilliant facial animation. Like there's scenes... Mm -hmm. I won't give something too much away between Peter and a guy who's a bad guy, but in public appears to be a good guy. And uh -huh. they know that they figured out, you know, that there's something wrong going on. And it's really tense. Yep. Meanwhile, our maids in the background are like, hey, isn't things great? And it reminded me of that scene in Spider-Man Homecoming <laughs> in the car with Michael Keaton and Tom Holland. And it's it's that yes. sort of thing. And it's, just, oh, they get it. They, yeah. get, they get it. That's the main thing. Beyond the great mechanics, the great uh, uh, the combat, the great story and everything. Insomniac, the people who made this game, clearly understand these characters mm -hmm. they do what Zack Snyder cannot because <laughs> Zack Snyder you know what Zack Snyder you can make a good movie I saw 300 that was a lot of fun you could possibly make a good movie but you don't understand Batman you don't understand Superman you do not understand these characters and so you will never fully be able to make something that is good about them that's why Henry Cavill has possibly fucked off so mm. And, and and this is why the MCU is so great, because they understand these characters, but also they're not above reinventing some characters. MJ is now no longer a model or an actor. She is now an investigative reporter, and it's an interesting new development. Yeah, I thought that was actually... Um, initially, I was a bit taken aback by that development. Uh, this is not a spoiler, by the way, because you're going to find it out in like the first three hours of the game which you will play in one sitting because it's really really good but you know um peter isn't at the daily bugle he's working at is it octavius's laboratories or whatever um and then mj is the reporter and initially i was a bit like whoa that's mm, that's a bit odd but it really works and it makes her character much more interesting to engage with and then there are segments in the game where you get to play as her and you don't resent having to do that because I think switching no. from being Spider-Man where you're swinging around through the city and basically, you know, leapfrogging off of roofs and going at the speed of goddamn sound to get to where you need to be and then switching to being MJ, I can see how maybe there would be a danger zone there where you're a bit like, oh, but I want, I want to go back to being Peter. But when you play as MJ, those scenes are pretty tense and... Mm kind of like ugh, there were a couple of scenes that i watched where i was like oh my god this is gonna go super south because she's sneaking around trying not to get sniped by people or whatever and you're just like what but they made they made her character much more because engaging Spider with spider-man we know he can just web swing away mary jane yeah, can't exactly. No, exactly. She's much more vulnerable, but at the same time, way more capable than I've seen her in films or in other games. Like, she does stuff, which I think is kind of important and cool, so... The first time we see her, she rescues Spider-Man. Yeah, she does, and I think she does 
couple of times from what I've seen. Like, she's a capable character and it makes her much more likable. And I think it makes you care more about their relationship because mm. they're much more of a partnership than they are. This is the damsel in distress and this is the superhero, you know? And in fairness, the comics uh, really weren't like that a lot, even in the beginning or in later uh, issues honestly there were times when she may have been in danger but that was mainly a mainstay of uh, the video games and the movies in the comics mm. she was actually a really interesting character and i did like the fact mm. that she was a model and a dancer and an actress but that was tied into a character because it was her covering up her traumatic childhood and trying to put on like a fun fun loving face to her deeper turmoil and they really it was a really interesting character mm. and one that really com complimented peter as a character as well and in later comics when she was actual focus on her being a working actor the comics mm. i mean my favorite run of spider-man is the one with uh uh john romita jr was drawing it uh with various other people doing it. i think j michael straczynski did it for a while and uh a lot of it a lot of these stories focused on uh her career and peter trying to support her or not being able to support her and him try, her trying to support him whilst also trying to focus on her life and it really mm. was a partnership and I think they they could have done it where she was an actor or something like that in this game but they wouldn't have that wouldn't have given her a lot to do in the story her being an investigative journalist does give a reason to be in the bad guy's hideout you know other than mm -hmm. being kidnapped so it makes sense for the story and I don't begrudge it I don't think her being an, uh, I, th I think, I, I guess I dislike it when someone says, oh, her being an actor or a model or something like that, that's uh, stupid because it doesn't make her a good character. You know what? People can be models and actors and that they can be, still be serious characters. That's fine. But if mm -hmm. this is one of the things where it works for this game and it makes sense and it's fine, but also it doesn't detract from anything that Peter's doing. Because I think in the um, Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon, uh, the first episode, and the only episode admittedly I saw, Mary Jane is photographer. And I kept on thinking, mm. like, but that's Peter's thing. Why are you being a photographer? You don't you don't need to steal something from Peter Parker. There are so many jobs you can do. Investigative reporter yeah. is one of those things. And it, it, it's interesting. It's, it's mm. interesting. And it works in this game. The characters work so well off each other. And it's just like, oh, my God. The first time we see a, a, a bit minor spoiler, it's not a really big thing. Peter and Mary Jane are currently broken up. They used to go out. They don't anymore. And Spider-Man and Peter is just like, they're in a bit of a tense situation. And Peter is just like, I, you know, I didn't think this would be how we meet up again. And Mary Jane was like, come on, Peter. This is exactly how I knew we meet up again. I'm just like, oh, yeah. you're so cute. Yeah. And that, like, that whole scene, because I know the one you're talking about, that whole scene where they do first meet up again is so... Like, it sets up their relationship so well. And immediately, you're kind of rooting for them, both of them, separately and as a couple. And I think that's just so... Uh, it's a testament to the writing and the voice acting. And I I don't know who the voice actors are for Peter and MJ, and I feel like I should because uh, they're nailing it. I don't know the voice actor for Mary Jane, but I know the voice actor for Peter is Yuri Lowenthal. He's been... Um... Oh, he's great. I love him. Yeah, he he's is great. He's in so many things. He's in so um, many Every voice yeah. actor is in so many things. I know, yeah. I mean, to be fair, there are those voice actors that if you you cannot click on an anime without that voice actor being in it, if it's an English dub. So, mm. uh, yeah. But I I've seen quite a few things with Yuri Lowenthal in, and he's uh, he's good. He's and he's very good in Spider Man too. He I think he really nails Peter. Peter's kind of awkwardness and his confidence at the same time which is quite nice really yeah so many other voice actors i mean they're, they're good um my particular favorite i suppose would be uh reno romano was it from the spider-man 2000 game oh right that's my guess, which i played on pc mm -hmm. I, th I thought he really was interesting but even then that was kind of um not necessarily cocky but very sure of himself and this yeah. piece is a bit more down to earth and a bit more, I don't know, neurotic or something like that. It, it, it's very... Um, it encapsulates what Peter Parker should sound like as a voice and as a character. Right, yeah. And I, I think the way that he plays Peter and Spider-Man, you know they're the same person, but Spider-Man comes off a bit more confident and a bit more cocky and Peter comes off a bit more cautious and particularly in his scenes with MJ you're like oh my god you're such an adorable little goof 
Um, oh. Oh. It's just so cute. Uh, but it also kind of lends credence to the idea that people don't know that Peter and Spider-Man are the same person, particularly if he speaks to them on the phone, because the way that Spider-Man speaks is more confident and the way that Peter speaks is a bit more sort of like, I'm just here to be a nice guy and help people out and have cute, awkward moments with MJ. And I think that's actually quite good. It's it's an yeah. interesting way to do it. Having said all of that, though, uh, in one of the earliest scenes uh, where Spider-Man has defeated the first bad guy of the game and he's been led away by the police, there was a uh, bit of a glitch where one of the um, one of the pedestrians that was watching the whole scene unfurl started vibrating like the fucking oh. flash and then oh. started rushing around the scene and sort of phasing through the bad guy's chest. Oh dear. Oh, only visual problem. Only visual glitch that's happened in the game so far. But that okay. was rather distracting. Albeit funny. I was like, God damn it, Barry. <laughs> um I've seen I think I've seen two glitches and neither of them well, one of them was probably on that level, but the other one wasn't so distracting that it was gonna really mess up your game for you. I have heard that sometimes the sound or the music you know when you're swinging around new york you've got this really nice music accompanying you and it makes you feel epic and awesome um and i have heard that on occasion that will not play or will cut out um and the other one was i saw a let's player playing i think it was i'm not sure what the mission was there were a lot of snipers involved and he got stuck in a wall uh which I did sort of think, whoa, that's pro that's a problem. That is oh, yeah. a problem. Oh, uh, actually, when... actually, something did happen to me uh, last night. Uh, I was beating up a bunch of bad guys that were coming out of mm. these uh, armored cars. I thought, well, I defeated all the bad guys. Wait a minute, there's two left. Where are they? Oh, they're sitting inside the other armored car. Are they going to get Damn out? Damn it, yeah. No, they're not going to get out. Can I beat them through the wall? No. Well, I'm not going to get my fucking crime tokens, aren't I? I want to fucking unlock this stealth suit from big time. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, though, if I was a criminal sitting in an armored car and I just watched Spider-Man beat up like 20 people, I would probably stay in the car, too. But I do appreciate that that's really annoying when you're trying to save up for a suit. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. And that's the thing. You see, uh, stuff unlocks as you progress through the game, but you do have to work for it. There are so many different side yeah. missions and stuff like that. And all of them contribute tokens that you use to upgrade your gadgets and so many gadgets, uh, suit powers, suit mods, and also uh, the suits themselves. So it's a case of, it's one of those great uh, gameplay reward into gameplay wheel reward wheel sort of things where you work for something, you get rewarded, you put that into something else. And so you're always doing something. You're never just milling around. There's always goals and objectives to, to, to do. And a lot of those goals and objectives are things you can just set yourselves. The game would say, now you have to craft this suit. Now you have to unlock this gadget. Uh... Most of the time, it's uh, just a case of, well, I want that gadget because that would be fun to play as, so I'm going to do these other things so I can get it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's quite nice because it gives you a bit of freedom um, in choosing what you want to do. Like, there's a mission where you can go around literally just collecting pigeons, <laughs> um, and if that's what Those you want to do, then pigeons. you can do that. Yeah, God, like these pigeons, man, they they are aerial aces. Um, but then there's like... Oh the my God, you know what I just, you know, sorry, I just, you know what I just realised? you know what I just realised? In yeah. doing that side mission, Peter Parker has turned into Dick Dastardly. Catch the pigeon, <laughs> catch the pigeon, catch the pigeon, stop the pigeon now! Yeah, but with much more success because, I mean, you do actually catch the pigeons. Yeah. But, yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I think overall from what I've seen of the game, which is quite a lot now, it's it's a really fun-looking game and it's engaging and the main storyline seems to be quite interesting especially if you already have knowledge of the spider-man universe like you meet characters like otto octavius and you're sort of like oh when's he gonna turn into the terrifying monster that i know he will and there's it really oh. plays off of that and 
it's just like I think Norman Osborn's in it as well, but he's like the mayor or something, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, that's but, gonna go south but, at some point, but, but when? He's, <laughs> he's still definitely Norman Osborn. Yeah. Oh it's, my god. Yeah. There's there's a lot of characters, and it's it's it's, it's really interesting, and uh, we could go on and on and talking about it, but I think could, I yeah. think we should probably end the show here. Thank you very much, Sean, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me and for chatting to me about all kinds of things, including my book and Spider-Man, because I have been waiting to talk to someone about that for a while. So thanks. <laughs> no worries. No worries. And to all the Xbox users out there, you have my deepest sympathies. Suck it! <laughs> and if you enjoy the show, Capers, please tell your friends, Shan from the Rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our other super episodes, uh, like when we talked with Sarah Millman or indeed when we went to Meemaw Comic Con and met up with her. And many other people there. And it was a lot of fun. And you can listen to the show on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, or at podcapers.com. We have a Patreon. Check out the rewards. Patreon.com forward slash AP2HYC. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come on the show yourself. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AP2HYC. Or email us at podcapers at AP2HYC.com. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo. The lovely microphone with the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Pod Capers, the official podcast or a place to hang your cape. Cue the music!